see. And uh, now everybody that's watching the replay is going to think that the pre-show is just that song over and over and over again. They're not going to have any idea at all uh, that y'all were just treated to an hour of music that you're probably not going to hear anywhere else, only here on your Liberty Radio. Welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, to the most listened to pirate radio station in the land of endless summer, I am your host, The Drizzle, at least last time I checked, uh, I don't know, looks the same to me, uh, let me know if anything has changed, if you are scoring along at home, but we are back together again for some open lines on a Friday night. And you know, it never fails, or at least it seems like it never fails. Uh, Every time right before the light goes on to let me know that we're broadcasting and we're live on the air, start getting that... uh, uh, I don't even know what to call it, right? Because it's not even like an emotion. It's, uh, it's just like energy. It's like, a, like nervous energy. Uh, and it just starts welling up. And then, uh, you know, blood starts pumping and body temperature goes up. Uh, everything increases. It's kind of wild that it still happens even after two years. And let's see, Mike's on... Looks like we're all, we're doing pretty good tonight. Haven't screwed anything up yet. Uh, but now that I say that, uh, that means the clock is ticking. So uh, if you're planning to call in tonight, you better do it. Uh, I just invoked the mechanical elves into our little soiree here. So uh, as I said, clock is ticking. Uh, hurry up and get in here on your Friday night open lines and we might even try something a little bit different this week and have some topics that we can talk around and beside and over the top and underneath of uh, if we need that kind of inspiration. So what is is everybody feeling out there in COVID land tonight? <clears throat> Excuse me. See, that just means I shouldn't be talking and you guys should be talking, calling in and letting us know what's on your mind. So who's going to be our first caller? That is the question. The second question is, how long are y'all going to let me hang by myself? It's been a hell of a week already. I would love to talk about it with any one of you. Phone lines are now open so that uh, you can call in and do exactly that. Because I don't have anything else planned for this segment. Uh, or for the next two hours, as a matter of fact. This is your time. This is where you get to be a part of the most listened to pirate radio station in the land of endless summer. Even if you cannot be in the land of endless summer, you can still play a part in what we're doing right here on Open Lines tonight. So if you haven't been tuning in uh, regularly to your uh, Liberty Radio broadcast schedule, maybe, maybe you missed the Wednesday night smorgasbord. Uh, I can understand if that happened because, of course, the, the menu was a little bit on the lean side. I mean, let's just uh, let's just call a spade a spade and get that out of the way. Uh, we were a bit lacking uh, in the nourishment department Wednesday night. I can handle that. Uh, I'm, I'm a big kid. I can take that criticism on my shoulders. 
But of course, if you did miss that, uh, then you also missed the announcement at the end of the show that uh, I think I'm going to be attempting a border crossing again here within the next couple of weeks because events have conspired to point me in that direction as far as I can tell. But that's kind of why I'm giving it a couple of weeks, right? Uh, Putting a few steps in front of me and the potential transit uh, to make sure that this is the right direction to be heading in, so to speak. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. I don't want to leave. I love living in the land of endless summer. Uh, It feels like home has ever since I've gotten here. Um, But we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, Right now, plans are being worked on. Details are being ironed out and sketched and uh, sometimes thrown against the wall to see how sticky they are. Uh, But we'll see. We'll see what happens. So again, that was the big news of my week. What was the big news of your week? Call in. Let us know about it. Uh, Maybe we can, uh, maybe, maybe you had a terrible week. Maybe you had all kinds of bad things that happened in your corner of COVID land this week. Call in and talk about them. And maybe, just maybe, we can find... I don't know, something like a silver lining in some of those clouds somewhere. Uh, Because you can't have one without the other. So something bad happens, something good has to uh, come from it in some form or fashion. That's just kind of how things work in this universe. All right. Well, I don't, I don't normally do an intro for this show, folks. So uh, if you're waiting for the right time, that time is now. Let's see. Did I actually put, because I, I did screw up last night, right? And I put the wrong link in uh, everywhere. I think I put it everywhere. And that was fun to go and trace all of those down and make sure that the right link got attached to them. And of course, it was very amusing for everyone in the social ghettos. We all laughed and laughed. It was so much fun. Yeah, I didn't train to do monologues, folks. So uh, the only way that this gets any better is if you start participating, the lines are now open. Uh, The link to the Zoom channel, or the Zoom call, it's a call, not a channel. The link to the Zoom call is in the Telegram channel. And uh, it is a public channel, so I don't think you even have to join. Uh, You can literally just look at it, and there's the link, and... You should be able to click on it and it'll get you in uh, so that you can talk with us about whatever is on your mind. Phone lines are now open. All right, let's see what I can find uh, until folks. All right. So this was, where did I find this? This was put up one year ago. All right. I think this was dropped in the WTF forum earlier today, the the chat for it, if I'm not mistaken. And I wanted to take a look at it, but of course I had been working So I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Maybe we can go ahead and do that right now as we're waiting for our first caller. Aha. Let me click that button. 
and drop down that thing and hit that. And now you can see what I was talking about. Now let's give a listen and a watch. In 2011, an official United States government document signed Con Plan 8888-11 was declassified. The following is an excerpt from the document. Quote, this document is unclassified to ensure maximum utility during times of crisis. Classified capabilities used to counter zombies will be addressed in appropriate orders and annexes adapted during crisis action planning and until current operational conditions are restored. End quote. Yes, you heard me correctly. It's a government plan to counter a zombie attack. Why would the U.S. government devote time, money, and resources to a zombie apocalypse? Do they really believe such an event is possible? What are the contingency plans for protecting the population, if any? Would they rely upon science or also include the myths and folklore surrounding such a phenomenon? Hello, I'm Colin. He Have we even figured out if this is something that's possible yet? Anyway. Eaton, former soldier, Marine Corps scout sniper, history professor, historian and book author. And we've answered these questions and other issues on this segment of Forgotten History. The first zombie tales date back to 17th century Haiti, where it was believed that African slaves who committed suicide became zombies and weren't allowed to go to heaven. Given the fact that zombies were unlikely to complain, they could work on the plantations for all eternity. Governments around the world have always worried about and planned for disasters, whether man-made such as war, famines, or natural events such as earthquakes and hurricanes. The government, being a large bureaucracy, has plans that would bring all of the national organizations of state on board in case such an event occurred. Their primary organization tasked with combating the walking dead is the Department of Defense, which controls the military. Military units would be dispersed and strategically located around areas where such an outbreak would occur as a containment procedure. Another organization would be the Department of Homeland Security possibly making sure that zombies do not cross the now wide open southern border with Mexico. Another and equally important department is the Centers for Disease Control, who would be tasked with identifying the cause of such an event and advising the President and DOD on methods of handling the outbreak. Considering the great job they did with all of the COVID-19 variants, I see no problem there. Yet, how would the CDC define the cause? one must assume that they would have to perform a forensic laboratory examination of a zombie. The Pentagon decided to use this scenario as a threat analysis and suppression methodology. In an unclassified document titled CONOP 8888, officials from U.S. Strategic Command considered a worldwide pandemic that may create the problem. It was considered a good template for dealing with all types of real-life, large-scale operations, emergencies, and catastrophes. Con Plan 8888-11 laid out a 31-page strategy in three parts. First, create and uphold a defensive plan to protect the population from such a threat. Second, establish procedures to eradicate any threat of zombies, regardless of the type. Third, restore law and order and the confidence of the people. However, the only way such a plan could be executed would be to implement martial law, using the military, including federalized National Guard troops. This would also be a matter of a possible constitutional conflict, which states or the federal agencies have jurisdiction over their areas of responsibility. The metrosexual populations of San Francisco or New York may not have the same approach to zombies as, say, the redneck in North Carolina or the cowboy in Texas. As implausible as this all seems, there was a case in 2006 in Petaluma, California, where chickens were killed using carbon monoxide. Not all of the hens died, as some rose to the occasion, wandering around like the walking dead until they finally expired as well. This taxpayer-funded excursion started in 2009 through 2010, where military personnel participating in the Joint Operational Planning and Execution System actively planned a mitigation and control method for such a zombie attack. Part of their plan was to establish a clear distinction as to which types of zombies they would be dealing with. 
Considering that medical schools do not teach their hopefuls on the merits and efficacy of having the undead as patients, this may have proved problematic. A wide variety of different zombies, each brandishing their own lethal threats, are possible to confront and should be planned for, according to the document. The government classified zombies into several categories, such as zombies created from bacteriological, viral, or pathogenic infection by aerial dispersion. Then there are the zombies created by a mystic, unknown magical sources, wandering around to feed upon the living. There are also vegetarian zombies, perhaps vegans, who eat plants and grains that pose no threat to humans due to their vegetarian nature, making us all feel much better. Or zombie life forms created after an organism is infected, possibly with radiation poisoning or a plague of some kind as yet to be determined. There is also the possibility of an extraterrestrial zombie invasion, which may present a different type of threat and alternate response. The Pentagon released their comments describing the necessity for such an exercise. Navy Captain Pamela Kuntz, a spokeswoman for U.S. Strategic Command, told CNN, The document is identified as a training tool used in an in-house training exercise where students learn about the basic concepts of military plans and order development through a fictional training scenario. This document is not a U.S. Strategic Command plan. End quote. Well, if that's the case, they went to great lengths to establish immediate response protocols and contingency plans to defend the nation and the people from zombies. The planning extended to active duty and reservist recalls, should the zombies appear, to include advanced parties, reconnaissance, and threat assessment teams. Every phase of the operation, from conducting general zombie awareness training and recalling all military personnel to their duty stations, to deploying said reconnaissance teams to ascertain the general safety of the environment, to restoring civil authority after the zombie threat has been neutralized or discussed. In dealing with these zombie threats, the official report states, quote, The only assumed way to effectively cause causalities to the zombie ranks by tactical force is the concentration of all firepower to the head, specifically the brain. The only way to ensure a zombie is dead is to burn the zombie corpses, end quote. Although within the document there is an inclusionary statement, quote, Maintain emergency plans to employ nuclear weapons within the continental United States to eradicate zombie hordes, end quote. Personally, I wonder why dropping white phosphorus, napalm, or using flamethrowers was not considered. Mm. The contingency containment plans include protecting hospitals and key structures that could be overrun by zombies, to include using remote-controlled drones and robots. The reason for the study was explained in that there is no real expectation of a zombie invasion. Much had to do with creating a training scenario that would not offend other nations as stated in the released document. Quote, Training examples for plans must accommodate the political fallout that occurs if the general public mistakenly believes that a fictional training scenario is actually a real plan, rather than risk such an outcome by teaching our augmentees using the fictional Tunisia or Nigeria scenarios used at Joint Combined Warfighting School, we elected to use a completely impossible scenario that can never be mistaken as a real plan. End quote. So, whether we go to war with Russia, China, or zombies, rest assured that every conceivable response has been thoroughly planned and we are in good hands. All right. All right. I think that is probably good enough. Um, I don't know. All I'm going to say about that is it it seems like the type of thing that you would do if you were trying to show somebody else this is how we put together our contingency plans let's use a hypothetical scenario okay we're going to pretend this hypothetical scenario is real so we have to go to the nth degree in laying this out um so no i don't think they were actually planning for uh, a potential zombie apocalypse that they would have to defend the country from at some point. Although the CDC has their own guidelines for dealing with zombie outbreaks, which they also claim is just a, a big goof, you know, so make of that what you will. Uh, Cause again, the, the, uh, military contingency apparently went to the trouble of actually breaking down different types of let's call them enemy combatants right 
the the fictional characters in their little scenario. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there we go. All right. So I still haven't figured out what is causing the crash, but I think we're going to try and work around here because Phytophiliac is actually in the Zoom room. So what I'm going to do, uh, and again, apologies to those on the stream uh, for it being interrupted. Uh, I am bound and determined to figure out what is causing this crash. All right, so I'm going to make Phytophiliac the host. Yes, which should keep the room open. And then that will allow me to leave. Yes, I know she's the host now. Thank you. Go away. All right. That'll allow me to leave and come back in, and hopefully that fixes the image problem. So uh, hang on, Fido. I'll be back in just a minute. Good Lord. All kinds of problems here on Liberty Radio. Oh, and that's even... Doing some fun stuff as well. All right, let's reload that. Let's see what happens. All right, go here, turn that on. Oh, I need to, yeah, bear with me, folks. I, I understand this is live radio, and you expect better quality than this. Uh, but we're working through the tech gremlins, so uh, it's okay. All right, we got that up and running. Let me make sure that's wide open. Put that there. We'll start that. And I'll go ahead and reclaim the host position. And Phytophiliac, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. All right. I can hear you a little bit. Can you get up on your mic a little bit more? How is that? Is that better? Mm, not a whole lot. Let's okay. see. Volume, up. Media volume. Well, I'm here to can you hear me better? That's it's still, yeah, it's still kind of low. Let me see. Mm -hmm. All right. My I'm going to boost the gain on the line. Okay. Who knows? It's probably my fault, you know, because <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. But I'll okay. apply a little bit of gain and hopefully... Uh, when other folks pop in, well, we'll just deal with that when it happens. And I'll just keep working on it. All right. All right. You still need a little bit more. So how are you doing this evening? I'm, I'm doing okay. Doing all right. Today was kind of, today was actually a good day. I, uh. Had a pretty solid day at work and uh, didn't really run into any hiccups, um, which is good for a Friday. We usually reserve those for Monday because, you know, that's hot next Monday. Oh, yeah. If stuff's going to mess up, it's going to be on Monday. We had a smooth transition to the weekend today, so I'm, I'm thankful for that. Good. That's good to hear. How is the Mr doing after his medical misadventures goodness great i swear he doesn't do anything the easy way and uh so it would be a super rare it type of infection that he got <laughs> but he's doing much better he ate he ate really well today um his appetite's been a problem here lately but um it's a lot it's improved quite a bit and um doing um wound cleaning dressing changes that sort of thing and it, it everything is healing and showing really good improvement so we're we're very glad to see all of that well that's good that's very good to hear because uh, i know he's 
probably not having a whole lot of fun uh, right nope. now, having to be uh, attended to and and nursed and all of that good stuff. He's a very terrible patient. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> but he's doing good. Well, I mean, he's kind of cranky under normal conditions, so uh, I can only imagine. <laughs> it's it's gotten better. That's good. So what's on your mind this evening? Oh, I, I caught the tail end of that video you were playing. And um, while at, at first listen, it sounds hilarious. It's like, um, it's like, are these people serious? Are they really planning a contingency for zombies? But if you think about it, and you think about how the government likes to change the meaning of words and they like to uh, hit people against each other. Uh, mix that with what you just played, and you have a recipe for some serious gaslighting. Um, if they ever thought to change the word zombie to something like, I don't know, uh, their definition of anarchist or extremist or any other undesirable category of human being, they already have a plan in place. Mm -hmm. for containing said undesirable and getting uh, getting control of that situation. So it's actually kind of scary if you think about it, how they're just out in the open. Oh, yeah, and if they're they're playing it up like it's a farce, like it's just, oh, we're, we're just, just kind of, yeah, we're just messing around just to see if we could, what we could come up with. And if you, if you replace that with any other category of person, it gets really scary really quick because well, you know what they're paying. Yeah, exactly. And that's an excellent point that you make because, uh, again, I don't think there was really anywhere in that video or in the communication from the people who were saying, oh, this was just for training purposes. Nowhere did they ever define what they meant by zombie. Right. They just kind of threw that word out there and they're allowing you to project the meaning onto it. So literally that word could mean anything because they never give you the context of the usage. Placeholder. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, how I, I mean, saw it. it Take a look at what's happening in some of the major U.S. cities right now, right? With that, uh, that substance that they call Trank that apparently everybody's hooked on, right? Like that's the big story in the media of the, the drug that's sweeping the nation and, and, you know, creating open air drug markets in what used to be pristine neighborhoods. I mean... Yeah. What's to stop them from referring to those people as zombies? Because they kind of act like that, you know? Yeah, they do. And one of the crazy things about um, Trank is that um, because it's it's a mixed it's a mixed drug. It's not it's not purely one type of drug. It's a combination of drugs, and one it it's laced with a drug that was developed for um, for animal use for, by veterinarians to um, to sedate animals for surgery. And it was not ever approved for use in humans. Mm -hmm. And so this uh, this drug it, it has a sedative effect. So when you combine it with fentanyl or any other drug, meth methamphetamine, whatever, whatever you're cutting that drug with uh, whatever drug you're cutting it with um, it amplifies the sedative effect so if you're using something like an opioid if you're if you're going to cut fentanyl with it or like maybe uh, like a hydrocodone or some other type of opiate it's going to massively increase the uh, the high that you get with that drug mm. And it's also going to uh, basically knock you out. The problem is, well, one of the things that people um, with the with the drug overdose, they've been passing out Narcan like crazy. Narcan is the the um, 
uh, the antidote basically for opiates. It completely reverses the effect of opiate medication within seconds to minutes, and you get a full recovery. So if somebody overdoses on fentanyl, you give them Narcan, and it completely reverses it. The problem is when you're giving a person who's overdosed on fentanyl laced with that that animal tranquilizer, it's not going to work because that animal tranquilizer is not a sedative, it's not an opiate. So you're, when you overdose on fentanyl, Narcan is not gonna work. And it's not going to save your life. Like people think it's going, they're, they're passing out Nar, uh, the, the Narcan to all the homeless people in San Francisco. Like mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, it's just paper, toilet paper. They're just, they're giving that crap away to these people. And they're, they'll sit there and watch each other overdose on, on fentanyl or whatever, and then they'll bring each other back with the Narcan. And I was reading up on Trank, and that's when I came across that with the Narcan, how it doesn't work. And they were just, I mean, they're just openly, you know, bragging about it, that how it saved so many lives, Narcan is wonderful. What it amounts to is they've taken away the risk of drug overdose by giving out this Narcan. So there is no incentive for people to not overdose. And they've, they've, uh, it's another example of them removing the consequences of an action, kind of like with abortion. They remove the consequences of irresponsible choice. And it, surprise, surprise, it's making it worse, making everything worse. Yeah, what it's, you got, Ash? Hey, hey everybody. Um, can y'all hear me okay? Yeah. We can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I just wanted to chime in on what Fido was saying, and um, I'm sure maybe she's going to get to this part, but there's something else that's very interesting about Trank as well, in that it is a vasoconstrictor, so when it, it reduces blood flow, to the injection site. So in a lot of these cities where Trank is really popular right now, like blowing up and spreading like a poison, it, uh, a lot of these people who are using are having really horrible infections from the use of Trank. And sometimes they're even use, losing their entire limb because of using it and losing the blood flow to that area. It's very crazy. Oh, wow. That's definitely not good. Uh, whenever you lose blood flow anywhere, uh, good things usually don't come from that. No, it's, it's very, very bad, actually. And uh, extended use of Frank actually causes open sores on the body, kind of like the way methamphetamine does. Oh, wow. And um, it, and, and they these sores will pop up anywhere. On the, it's random. It, I know with meth, a lot of times they'll pop up on the face and on the arms and legs. And uh, the, the the drug that is, um, I forget what the, xylazine, that's what it is. Mm. Xylazine mm. does that, same thing. It causes open sores in humans. It doesn't do that with animals because they don't use it regularly in animals. They just, it's like a one-time dose of surgery and, and then the animals are done with it. But um, an extended prolonged use of xylazine in humans causes open sores. And they know that from all the people that are using it late, uh uh, cutting their drugs with, hmm. and so and it gives the appearance of uh, a zombie look. That you know they have like rotting sections of skin because there's no blood flow, and of course you know drug addicts are not concerned with open wounds; they're worried about getting high. Right. So they're not yet you know they're not going to seek treatment for their wounds. Well, they they will if they can get a script. That's true. But yeah. you're not going to get a script for xylazine. Yeah. <laughs> but so, if if it, if it can get them access to more drugs, then yes, they'll they'll, they'll they would probably be they probably would seek out medical attention. So what is xylazine used for in the clinical setting? Oh, it's it's the one I was telling. You. It's the veter it's a veterinary medicine. It was approved for use in animals. It's an animal sedative that they give animals when they're prepping them for surgery. Okay, so is it like similar to ketamine then? Um, I'm not sure. 
maybe a little bit yeah it is a it is, but it's a tranquilizer it's not an opiate it mm. it does the same thing in that it does cause euphoria it does cause sedation and and that sort of thing but it's it is not affected by uh opiate reversal agents mm. Again, folks, uh, Liberty Radio is for entertainment purposes only. This is not meant to be instructional material. Uh, but uh, you do you out there in COVID <laughs> land. I'm not going to tell you not to do drugs, but I mean, you know, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to risk your life and limb to do drugs, you go. You do whatever you feel like you got to do. But, uh, there's consequences to all of our choices. That's Especially, absolutely right. And you that don't is, know who that you're getting that from, too. You know, you don't know where they're getting that from. You don't know what. Well, yep. And that was the other thing that I was going to say. So since this has been seen in so many cities, and uh, like Fido said, it's not made for humans, where is it coming from? Who is putting it out there? Now, I, of course, have my own suspicions because, uh, I think a lot of a lot of the drugs in this country lead right back to the CIA. But where is this coming from? How did it even become a thing? You know. Well, I tell you one thing. When I was researching xylazine, I found that one of the biggest uh, manufacturers of xylazine is in China. And there's a few in other places around the world, but China has the biggest uh, manufacturer distributor uh, distribution of xylazine. And it's coming in, it's being shipped into Mexico. Really? Yep. Do you know from what part of Mexico? Um, no, I, I, it, it kind of got fuzzy. Uh, it really kind of yeah. got unclear. You know, they don't really like to talk about the distribution and manufacture of drugs and stuff. And it, it there was um, there was a website that showed the manufacturers of xylazine, and I think there was one in um, I think there's one in uh, Britain or the UK, and then there's one in China, and then I think there is one in Mexico. So mm. it's not a whole lot of places that are. And there's, I think there's one in Ohio. There's a manufacturer in Ohio, but it's like that would make sense because there's a lot of Chinese investment in Ohio. So, I mean, hmm. I'm not saying it's China doing anything wrong. I'm just saying that you know the links are there, and it's it's interesting to me that it's only been here recently because this was they've been making xylazine for. I mean, it's been around for decades i mean it's been a long time but it's only in the last probably what 10 maybe 15 years that we've been seeing an increase of xylazine lace fentanyl and methamphetamine and cocaine well yeah because it became uh more efficient to do it that way where in the past uh if they were cutting the heroin or the cocaine or the meth or whatever uh if they were cutting it with something uh, it wasn't a synthetic chemical that they could produce on the cheap, right? Like that's, right. that's technology that's really only become widely available in probably the last couple of decades. Um, and especially the ability to mass produce something like that. So I don't know, think of it like if you're looking at it from a historical standpoint and you understand that the people who were uh, pulling all the strings behind Great Britain and the British East India Company when they went into China and basically like laid waste to the country uh, through the, the opium wars in the 19th century. And you think, well, you know, here we are couple hundred years later almost and China is now a rising power and maybe they feel like they want to throw off the shackles of the Anglo-American establishment and give them some of their own medicine in the process so to speak oh also uh you just made me think of something else um when I was doing my research on xylazine I found that 
um, the um, the half life of xylazine is actually quite short. So that means that it's only present in the body for a short amount of time. So it is hmm. only detectable in the human when a human when someone takes it. It's only detectable for a short period of time. So gotcha. if you're not looking for it, and a lot of labs don't test for it right. when they're doing like drug screenings and stuff, mm -hmm. they're not looking for xylosine. So they're not going to know necessarily unless they have some kind of tip that the, per the drug the person took was laced with xylosine. They're not going to know to look for it per se. What and a, uh, what about so my, it, you might not know the answer to this question, but what about like on an autopsy? Is that something they would normally yeah. screen for on that oh no they wouldn't and here's the thing right around the time that the xylazine started making a really big showing on uh in the street drugs when people mm -hmm. started really using it and cutting drugs with it that was right and i'm not saying this is what happened but it's it's the coincidence is is too obvious to me i i'm just speculating here but I'm not entirely convinced that's not what killed Philip Seymour Hoffman and his fentanyl overdose. Oh, wow. I so hadn't right thought about the that. Time, just right around the same time that Xylazine made a really big uh, show up on the, on the drug scene, yeah. right when Philip Seymour Hoffman died of his fentanyl overdose. Huh. And that's interesting. If tried, and if they had tried to administer Narcan to pull him out of it, it wasn't going to work because he his fentanyl was like the xylazine probably possibly maybe i don't know i don't have any facts to back that up but it makes it makes makes sense to me why he wouldn't i mean he's a he's a celebrity you know they they're gonna throw everything they can at saving these celebrities and oh and especially one visit, like him you know because his his star life, was still on the yeah. way up right and if they couldn't save his life with all the money and and the technology and the uh, medical advancements that they could throw at him they couldn't save his life. Their chances are there's something else going on, and he mm. just—I don't know if he, somebody gave him that fentanyl that was laced with xylazine, or it was just a coincidence. I don't. Know. Lots of speculation to go around. For, but it's just an interesting thought I had. Wow, that is an interesting thought, because uh, that yeah. wasn't something that I had even connected. Yep. Funny when you find it's funny. The things that you find when you start digging into stuff. <laughs> this is true. Funny little rabbit holes. And my personal theory about why it's here is that it's being allowed to come here. So I don't oh, yeah. think at this point that there's much of a distinction between the like the China uh, drug cartel, like Mexican drug cartel, United States pipeline. So I think it's like just more of the intentional destruction of you know, a lot of people that would be able to oppose the system. It's war, except for people don't even realize that they are at war, but war has been declared on them. Absolutely. I agree 100%. You know, I don't think that any, any drugs, any of the drugs that are not available on the street you can get, I don't think any of that's there by accident. And I don't think it's just drug dealers trying to make a quick buck. I, I genuinely believe that it's being allowed to propagate and spread and um, and kill people. Oh, and, it's yeah. it's not just it's being practical. allowed. It's it's big business. It's one of the things yeah. that makes the world go round. This is this is not anything new. Uh, the the trade in illicit substances, the trade in weapons, the trade in sex. Uh, these these are all hundreds. Uh, and, and possibly thousands of years old. And in some cases, uh, the same uh, groups have been running these businesses uh, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, as far as we can tell. Because um, again, it's, this is all information that has been pieced together over time because they... They do a decent job uh, of covering their tracks, you know, with uh, with great wealth tends to come great power. And that allows you to do things like, you know, write history books and uh, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, 
but yeah, it's it you're one hundred percent correct that it's not there by chance, it's there by design. And it's not a coincidence that it's easier to get illegal drugs in South Central LA, uh, literally like on the street corner, than it is in Beverly Hills. Because they don't do business on the street in Beverly Hills. You go into the house to do business in Beverly Hills, right? But in South it's Central, funny. you can just go and get right on the street. It's funny that you mentioned the availability of illegal drugs because, you know, um, when, um, when JP got out of the hospital, the doctor, the second time, the doctor wanted to put him on some Norco for his pain because he has a big surgical wound and obviously it's going to cause a lot of pain. So we're going to do some Norco just for the short term, just to get him through the healing process. And he sent the prescription to the pharmacy here in our, in our town. And I called to make sure that they had it. And they said, there's no Norco available at any of our local pharmacies. Any in our town, we have like maybe six or seven pharmacies. Not a single one of them had any Norco at all available for public consumption. Is so that unusual? That is highly unusual. And they kept telling me there was a there's a manufacturing shortage. Mm -hmm. So I got to looking into it, and the um, it's not just that they the manufacturer the manufacturer they're using. Um, I'm, I'm guessing the pharmacies were all using pretty much the same manufacturer because it's just there's one manufacturer that for some reason they got shut down or their their production got halted or something happened. I'm not sure exactly, but this one particular manufacturer is not distributing anymore. So there are others, but the pharmacies that we use or that that we were trying to use couldn't get it from the, the places they normally get it from, and it's on back order. And they don't know when they're going to get any. And so when I looked it up, it's not when there's a shortage of something like Norco, they can't just ramp up production. The DEA has such a tight grip on these um, opiate manufacturers and distributors. They can't, there's, they're only allowed, each manufacturer, manufacturing company is only allowed a set amount that they can make and distribute. Mm one mm. time kind of like kind of like the um like with the diamonds there's only a set yeah. amount that they can leave at any given time right so it's not and like, how it's not like so it's like if there is a shortage if they if, if the pharmacies run out it's not like the pharmacies can just like hey we need y'all to send us as much as you can they they can't even like double their stuff they can only just keep a set amount coming out at any specific time and i didn't know that um but yeah, that, I just thought that was really interesting too. So we ended up switching him to something else. Um, I think we ended up with Tylenol 4 and it doesn't really do much anything. I was like, you know what? I think he's to the point now where he doesn't even really want to use anything um, that strong, opiate wise. So um, he's been using it sparingly and um, he's not even really, I don't even think it's, it's doing anything for him anyway. But uh, he's managing without it. And um but I can't imagine these people that actually need it, that actually use it like they're supposed to, and they can't get it because this whole thing has just been completely, you know, just it's been blown out of proportion mm. completely, completely. And the people that are abusing it can get it for some reason. But <laughs> the ones who exactly. Really that's yeah. what I, that's what I was gonna say. I was like, and interestingly enough, like a a medical patient actually needs pain medication, and oh, sorry, we don't have it. We don't know what's going on, and yet there is an unlimited amount of heroin, fentanyl, apparently trank, whatever you would want on the street, and so it just goes to tell you that if uh, the people running the show actually wanted to do anything about it something would be done about it, but yeah. they're in on it. So yeah. there isn't. Well, we already waged a war on drugs, or I should say the United States waged a war on drugs and drugs won. They, uh, they admitted defeat. What was it? Five years ago, I think right before pulled out of Afghanistan, it was just like a bunch of defeats right in a row. One of them was the yeah. war on drugs. <laughs> Do you think I could get them to wage a war on my bank account? <laughs> <laughs> 
you really want them to do that? I mean, you they're, don't they're want that when they're already doing it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> Oh, no, they, they nope. intentionally destroy and, um, and then they, and then they penalize people for seeking out alternatives. And it's like, there's no, there's no solution. If, it's like you cannot win and you can't, you can't get ahead using the tools that they give you because the tools are meant to enslave you. Mm -hmm. That's the point. The, the, the options that you're given and the, the, the opportunities that you're given, they are, they are designed to enslave you and keep you trapped. And, and that's why these people who, who, who talk about, oh, well, we need to vote in, we need to, we need to elect so-and-so to get in there and, and make changes. They're, if they're not part of the system now, they will be when they get in there. and nothing is going to change. They're only telling you what you want to hear. And you're not going to, you're not going to change anything in this world by voting for somebody into office. I wish 100%. More yeah. And, you know, I like the idea of people that are like-minded, that are on the same page, that are friends, are starting to build the alternate communities, right? The, the other options to that, like um, instead of a traditional mainstream corporate radio show, we've got the Drizzle Show. And then instead of corporate bought out, paid for music, we have Fido's music and, you know, like Media Monarchy. And so I think people are doing good stuff out there and you're exactly right. If you stay in the system, the system will keep you down, but we can work around that system in, you know, a lot of different ways. So that's pretty cool. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, for my mind, that is exactly what we should be doing. I mean, that was, that was one of the light bulbs that went off in my head back in 2020, 2021, somewhere around in there. Um, before Liberty Radio became a thing was, all right, in order for people to actually be able to exit out of the system, right, and, and uh, take back their agency, take back their power from the system and start actually uh, living their lives, uh, they're going to need replacements for these things that they've been used to having, right? Like we all grew up with a television set in the house or most of us grew up with a television set in the house, right? So we're used to having this box in the house that entertains us. Okay, well, when you leave the system, you, you still have that desire to be entertained at the end of a long day, right? Like you worked hard, uh, you accomplished the things that you set out to accomplish. Now you just, you want somebody else to do the work so that you can, you know, just kind of space out or whatever. Or maybe you, you like to learn new things and, and you want something in that vein. Uh, you need to have those options outside of the system and if you don't have them then what tends to end up happening is people fall back into their same old habits and patterns and that's how you end up getting sucked back into the system so me doing this is a drop in the bucket but then you add in another drop with James Evan Pilato over at Media Monarchy and you add in another drop with James Corbett and you add another drop with Ryan over at T-Lab and you drop in Grand Theft World and you drop in all these other creators in the independent space, right? And not the big names that everyone knows about because 99% of them probably aren't real. Right. We're talking about the people yeah. that don't have audience in the hundreds of thousands or the millions. The one obvious exception there being Jay Dyer, because anybody who's been following Jay Dyer for even a while knows he started with nothing 10 years ago and built what he has today. Nothing was given to him. Right. So, again, 
if you don't have those parallel structures, people don't have anything to gravitate towards. So the thing that made sense to me was, all right, uh, what, what do I want that I used to get from the system that I can no longer get? And that was, to me, it was quality radio, right? Like something good to listen to both music wise and news wise and informational and whatever, uh, something that was informative would entertain you, make you laugh, hopefully. Um, and, and just, you know, make your life a little bit better for the fact that it's there and it exists. And I kind of took all of that and, you know, mushed it up and made it Liberty Radio. And hopefully it provides at least one of those things for other people uh, while, you know, driving me crazy in the process. But <laughs> that, like I said, that's the way I see out. If, if there is something that you see that you think should exist in the world, whatever it is, and nobody else is doing it, that means you're supposed to do that thing. And if you can do it outside of the existing system of slavery, all the better. Because again, if it's, if it's a need in the market and, and the market is huge, it has a lot of needs, but if it is an actual need, then people will find it and they will gravitate towards it. And you know, it will grow from there. You know what that's called? No, I don't. Just, What's it called? See a, need, see a need, fill a need. You see it, and you have the. If you see there is something that 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 we don't have that we do need, and you have that ability, it is your responsibility to fill that. Um, or if you can figure out how to make it happen, even you know, yeah, if, if you, if maybe it's okay. not your skill, but you know somebody that has that skill, but they don't see that need. Well, you can help facilitate that. Which is why I was wanting to, I don't, and I haven't really searched too much, but I know there is, um, there are a lot of people who are stuck uh, being reliant upon the current healthcare system. And they think that pharmaceuticals are the only way that they're ever going to be able to be healthy and happy and, and well. And, that's not the case. It's actually the opposite of the case. And I want to be able to get to a point where I can have a place where people can go for information about what they can do to be healthy. And maybe even at some point develop some kind of consultation thing where I can talk directly to people like on a one-on-one -on -one basis and, and help them make decisions for their life that will benefit their health and i'm not telling people you know you have to take this medic this this supplement or whatever but kind of give people like direction on where to go to find information here um and, and 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 educate patients patient teaching has always been uh something that i've had a heart for in nursing and it was really interesting because i i Started, I took the LVN course at a local community college uh, back in 2007, 2007. and um, I found that teaching patients about the things that are making them sick and the things that they can do to make themselves better or alleviate some of their symptoms was something that I thoroughly enjoyed doing, and that's like the most basic aspect of nursing. And there's things that people just really don't know. And it really surprised me the, the information gap that was out there for patients. And a lot of the reasons that they weren't um, doing the things that they needed to do is because they didn't know what they needed to do. And nobody had ever really set them down and explained it to them. And what's interesting is when I sat for my board exam um, with, uh, with all nurses, LVNs and RNs, they had, they had the board exam is a set of questions and you're sitting at this computer answering questions and you answer so many questions, everybody gets a different number, but there's an algorithm that, that determines you get so many answers correct, so many answers wrong. And at a certain point, the algorithm determines that you are a pass or a fail. 
And so my my questions, I think I ended up having like um, 150. Some people had 100, some people had 65. But it's however many questions that you answer correct for the algorithm to determine if you know enough to pass. And um, hmm. the questions, they range all across the health, the, the spectrum of healthcare. There'll be, you know, cardiac questions, there'll be um, uh, OB and uh, OBGYN questions, there'll be um, medical surgical questions like how to take care of a patient after surgery, just random, just, they're all random. Some emergency care questions, some long-term care questions, just random. And the majority of my questions so were all about patient teaching. And it, it was, it was, it was almost like divine intervention that I got all of those questions because it's, it's usually a, like a, a, a it's like randomized questions. There's not going to be just a whole bunch of just one type of question. The majority of mine were patient teaching, which is really, really interesting since that was kind of like my wheelhouse of nursing. And uh, so patient teaching has always been my thing. And trying to find a way to present the information in a way that people can understand has, um, has kind of been the thing that drives me. And I just, I, I want to do that for other people. Because it's really, it's pretty straightforward once you get down to it. It's just, I, I'm not a salesman. <laughs> I don't know how to market information. I just put it out in plain um, chronological or, you know, uh, in, in, practice, in a practical way and try to make sure I'm as thorough as possible and as detailed as possible without losing the audience. But um, yeah, it's, it's just something I've always wanted to do. And this, this can go even with like, uh, if you wanted to go with like homeopathy or naturopath uh, treatments for common ailments, um, it could be applied the same way. And because a lot of people don't know about the things that you can just do at home for, uh, for common ailments, like kidney stuff. You don't actually have to go to doctors for a kidney stuff, uh, believe it or not. I, uh, I shared my husband's, well, here, I treated my husband's kidney stones at home with, um, stuff. I'm not going to tell you what it was. This, this is not medical information. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, we we resolved his kidney stone, the last one he had. It, it came out, and we had a friend who had just recently gone to see a urologist because he had a kidney stone, and he went, and they went to specialists. They had to go spend all the money, and we spent, I think, $500 for a, a scan just to make sure that that's what it was and that's what it was, and so we created it at home and haven't had any problems. And, nice. Uh, it's, it's knowing what you're looking for, and deciding for yourself if that's what you want to do, and it there 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 can be a lot of contingencies that go along with it, and things to be aware of um, when to go seek a higher level of professional care for something. That's really a lot. People don't know. Okay, so when do I re actually need to go get real? Right. You know, not, but when do I need to get a higher level of care? And because a lot of stuff you can treat at home, but some stuff. Like what my husband just had to go through with his infection, that was completely outside of my my realm, and uh, we did see a uh, higher up level of care for that. And he had to have surgery, to have it well, fixed. That's nothing I would have been able to do at home. But right. Well, to prior to the twentieth century, though, everybody <laughs> got treated at home. Right. Because well, there I will say really that hospitals. I mean, there were, but. They were few and far between. I will say this. If it wasn't for our ability to go and get him surgery, he would have died. This infection would have killed him. He would mm. not have lasted that weekend at all. And so I am I am extremely grateful for the ability to go get surgery when it's necessary. But sometimes it's not necessary to. If you can, if you can maintain your health, you can avoid a lot of the catastrophic health problems. And oh, yeah. that's what I want to get people in the mindset of. It's like, we're not looking to treat severe medical conditions. We're looking to prevent 
to your serious medical condition. And if you if you try to have a healthy lifestyle and and find what works for you, keeping you healthy and you well, you will not have to deal with amputation. You will not have to deal with a major invasive surgery. Oh Jesus, amputation. Up. Yeah. God, like, has that become a more common thing? Yes, you, you would be surprised. You know, uh, speaking God. of amputation, I will say this, uh, working at a nursing home, um, doing the job that I'm doing now, we had a patient, it was a few years ago, uh, maybe five, five years, five, six years ago. She, she was a really heavy smoker. Okay. And, um, she smoked all of her life. And she had no desire to quit whatsoever. She didn't want to quit. She got a sore on her foot. And smoking a lot, um, it diminishes your body's um, ability to get blood flow to your extremities. Mm -hmm. And so we're at risk of developing sores and um, severe complications from, um, there's, there's several complications you can have from an untreated sore. So anyway, this lady, she's probably in her 80s, I think, and she got the sore on her foot. Well, we tried treating it the best we could. She was really non-compliant. She really just, she wanted to go outside and smoke, and we kept telling her, if you keep smoking, it's only going to get worse. It's never going to get better. I don't care. I'm going to keep smoking. So she kept smoking. Well, the sore kept getting worse and worse and worse, and they sent her to the cardiologist because she needed to have they call it rotorootering. That's not the actual medical term for it, but that's basically the concept. They go in and they uh, tunnel out the, the blood vessel in the leg to improve the blood flow. So the blood Ugh. will start flowing back to the foot. It's a pretty invasive surgery. <laughs> and Sounds so like she, she didn't want to do that. She's like, I don't care. I wouldn't want to do that either. And so she would, uh, she would get pain medicine for the pain in her foot. And then she would go outside and smoke. Well, the sore <laughs> got worse and worse and worse. And, the, the, the occlusion, the, the blockage in her leg got so bad that the blood literally stopped flowing to her foot. And her foot turned, this is a little white lady, her foot turned black. Ooh. I mean, her whole foot was black. The whole thing. It started with her toe, and then it was her whole foot. And she how, was how rolling quick, around. How quick did it take her whole foot to turn black? It was a, probably about a month, I think. It, I mean, once the, the toe actually went black first, and then the rest of the foot went black. So in about a period of about a month, her whole foot turned black. Oh, my God. And it was, and it was cold. It was like touching an ice cube. Yeah, it was dead. That is so bleak. It is, it is so bleak. bizarre. Yeah, it's totally bizarre. Well, her foot kept getting worse and worse and worse. Well, she was rolling around. She would not put a sock on her foot. She would not cover up her foot at all. She would not let them bandage it to kind of you know, for some discretion, you know, when she's rolling around the facility in her wheelchair and she had her foot sticking out and her big black <laughs> foot sticking out and it was freaking out all the other residents. They're like, oh my God, she's got some kind of contagious thing going on in her foot. And it was freaking everybody out. And she would not cover up that damn foot. <laughs> I, 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 I shouldn't laugh. Crazy. shouldn't laugh, but it's, it's just... This lady, she's just, that was just her. She was just obstinate as all get out. She would not do anything that you told her she needed to do. And, that is uh, a wild story. Hey, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just, I got to run, guys. So I just wanted to tell you all good night. It was really good chatting with you. It was great. Yeah, it was to good to have you on, Ash. Thanks for joining and congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll talk to you all soon, okay? Well, actually, you might not. Your Friday nights are going to be busy. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Have a good night. That's a good point. Yeah, you too. Talk to y'all later. Bye. Bye bye. Well, I see bye. that uh Recycle Bin Laden has joined us uh on the call tonight. What up, RBL? I'm just chilling. Just thought I'd say hi. I just got home. Oh yeah. Not too long ago. And uh saw you're having your show. Yeah, well, we were shopping, so oh, okay. Yeah, it was a couple hours ago I got home, but it feels like I just got home. <laughs> what what happened with Ashley to get uh, her uh, congrats on our Friday nights and all that? Ashley is uh, joining the tenth season of Autonomy. 
Uh, oh, she sweet. made it oh, wow. official tonight. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so she is going to be busy for the rest of the year, pretty much. Yeah. <clears throat> My daughter has expressed an interest in looking into that sort of thing. She's uh she's fifteen and she's like, Wow, is that something that I can still do? I was like, Well, let's take it one step at a time right now. Let's uh let's get you through the obstacle course and see if this is something that you really want to do. Mm. So I gotta send her the link for the obstacle course. And um we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> So does that mean that she signed up for the course or she's teaching no. one of the Yeah, oh, she signed up. At... She's a student. Cool. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I mean it's it's a big step for anybody to take because it is an investment. Uh but uh if you put in the work, you should get something out of it and most people end up getting a lot more than that. Um I haven't heard anybody say anything bad about it. I mean, I think everybody that's gone, everyone that I've heard that has gone through it has all, all had like rave reviews about it. Well, it's a, it's an experience to be sure. I mean, if you, if you actually dig into the course material and, and you do the work that is associated with it, um, there, there's no way you can't come out of the 12 weeks as the same person that you went in. It's, it's just not possible. Um, or at least it wasn't for me. I don't know. I, maybe there's somebody out there that could do it. Um, but it, it's such a, um, I don't know. There, like there are times that there just aren't words sufficient to describe like what what is possible and it's it's all really and you know i've said this over and over again and and many other uh hundreds of people now at this point have said <clears throat> it too but it's it's really the community that makes a lot of what happens in autonomy possible um, and i'm not saying that to try and shortchange what richard does at all because the work that he puts in is phenomenal but the community just adds so much more on top of that and really creates the atmosphere that allows for the explosive type of growth uh, to happen for people. Um, and it's, you know, everybody's experience is different, which is, as far as, as my experience in any sort of educational setting, everyone being able to have their own experience and all of those experiences being considered valid, like that's never happened before. I've never seen an example of that anywhere in the world before. Um, right. And so, I mean, to me, that right there just kind of makes it uh, exceptional. Yeah, I, I, I want to do it too. I just, we, we got to get to a point where that is an option. So, and I hope it happens sooner rather than later. Um, Cause I've been wanting to get out of this job that I do um, for a while now. And I thought music was going to be kind of my out. Um, it hasn't quite gone like I anticipated. A lot of things kind of went sideways with it. And I still plan on doing the music and keep making music, but it's not going to be the primary a driver of what I do um, it's just still gonna it's gonna remain a hobby more or less so my my music production is going to diminish but it's the, the quantity is going to diminish not quality um, but um, I do plan on doing something else um, as the primary uh, thing that I want to do so I, I know that autonomy is going to help me achieve that goal and it's just you know, money is always the issue and time is an issue. So I'm not a very good uh, time manager. <laughs> I gotta get better at that. Well, um, and who says you have to have a primary thing? You know, why, why can't you have like two or three things that you split your time amongst? Because I'm not a very good multitasker. Uh, I'm terrible at multitasking. <laughs> so I need to have at least one 
some some focus i i can have like side pro i have tons of side projects and none of them are ever finished none of them are ever like um taking off and doing really really well um uh, except this one thing that i'm working on right now but um mm -hmm. that's a surprise for later but um like i have like little side projects but my full-time job is like my primary focus right now and i would like that primary focus to be something else I don't want to be working for somebody else. I want to do my own thing. Aren't there private nurses for rich old ladies? There like, are, but they take up a lot of time. They take mm, up more time than what it would than be your more shift. Time. You'd be right. you'd be I, working I, more. I, huh? I, do, I do. I say I have guaranteed forty hours a week. Uh, sometimes I do a little more. I usually have a little bit of overtime, but I usually have my evenings and weekends free, which. That's one of the reasons why I haven't left this job is because I have a lot of autonomy with my job. I have, uh, I'm, I'm left to my own devices quite a bit and um, I know what needs to be done. So I'm able to get it done. And I do have a lot of free time. It's pretty flexible. If I need to like run do stuff, I can go do, do it. And I'm, I'm not beholden to the time clock, so to speak, like most people are. And it's like with this job, I was able to be in at the hospital with my husband while he was in the hospital and I was able to work remotely. So like if I work for like a nursing home or a hospital, I wouldn't be able to do. That. Um, so this job does have a lot of flexibility that I will not be able to find anywhere else. And it's literally the only reason I haven't left it yet is because of the flexibility. Um, and until I can find something else that will um, help pay the bills, and um, keep us fed and a roof over our head and that is that, that I really enjoy, I'll probably be stuck in this job until that happens. So, but I, I am, I'm thinking about it. I'm trying to make plans, trying to figure things out. It's, I'm, I don't plan on staying with this forever. So I guess that's the important thing is, you know, making well, plans. Well, the way things are going, I, I don't know if they plan on employing humans in the medical industry forever kind of seems like y'all are being phased out at the moment I'm under, i am under no illusion that a uh, an out a, a properly trained algorithm could literally do my job i, I i'm i'm not you sure about that, that? i do I, I do believe that a properly trained algorithm or computer program could literally do my job for me i do um i'm i'm basically a glorified secretary and i've been told to stop saying that but it is it's true if you look at the job duties that i have the, the job description i am a glorified secretary and yeah, medical uh, medical transcriptionists yeah. were already replaced yeah um, by AI. I'm, I'm were they really of, yeah a good friend yeah, of mine uh, yeah they have a program that was his now. career and it's gone yeah, my mom actually used to do that for a while. She he was very good, very fast. Yeah. yeah, my mom was a really fast typer. She, uh, but no, they have the um the voice recognition software now. So uh, it's, they have it's called Dragon, I think is the name of the program. And then there's other programs, but Dragon is like the best one. And the hospitals around here use it, and they don't even send off the uh, the tape anymore, the recordings anymore for people to do it. The computer does voice recognition. Oh wow! Yeah, dictation. I did not yeah, realize that was going to be the first class to go. Yep. But I guess yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> Anything I mean, Sally Struthers just... was right. uh, saying to do. <laughs> That's all AI now. The, or get uh, your degree. The pen foster classes. <laughs> Do you remember the Penn Foster classes? They had the infomercial on TV. You could, they had like a, like 50 classes you could take. One of them that is still around, believe it or not, is medical billing and coding. They still have not completely phased that out to AI yet. Hmm. Although it is, it is on the fast track. Wow. I think, one on. of my, I think my ex's uh, oldest kid who uh, was having trouble figuring out what he wanted to do in life besides play video games. I think it, at one point there was talk of him 
getting licensed like to become a coder. Uh, and uh, I just think it'd be mighty ironic if he actually did that. And then a couple of years later, he's out of a job because of AI. <laughs> yeah. I probably shouldn't laugh about that, but, you know, oh, well, I'm petty sometimes. I know, I know Drizzle, I, you and I have had the conversation about um, about AI in um, in healthcare. And, you know, the, the, the job that I do, the program that the software that we work with, they use, and we've talked about this, they use something called structured data. And it's when, so like, say, in the progress note, they talk, they, they want to know if the patient is a smoker. And so we put in, yes, they are a smoker. And it generates a list of questions, like how many cigarettes a day do they smoke? When did they start smoking? And how many times a day, I mean, how many, how soon after they wake up do they smoke a cigarette? You know, all that information is in, entered into the progress note and at a certain level of the software you can generate a report and it will tell you how many of your patients are smokers how many packs a day mm -hmm. they smoke and you, all of that information is um, training algorithms to mm -hmm. to manage that data and it's not just for smokers it's for medications for diagnosis codes and when they switched over in 2019, I believe they switched to the ICD-10 code. They, um, the ICD-10 codes are, are a lot more specific in the verbiage that uh, that is uh, attached to the, the number. It's a letter and a, a series of numbers, mm -hmm. and the you have a letter, two numbers, a dot, and then two more numbers or three numbers, and each number generates a specific uh, complexity of that diagnosis code. So you don't just have a diabetic. Right. You don't just have type 2 diabetes. You have type 2 diabetes with hyperglycemia, uh, elevated blood sugar. You have hyperglycemia. You have type 2 diabetes with chronic kidney disease. You have type 2 diabetes with diabetic retinopathy. So there's this added level of complexity to the diagnosis codes that is basically training the algorithm so when you enter a diagnosis code the computer knows specifically what all is wrong with this patient and then you have a series of diagnosis codes and it gives you an entire picture of the patient and right. so of their overall this, health allegedly right and these codes also can be uh used to generate reports like how many of your patients have this condition how many mm -hmm. of them have that condition how many of them are compliant with their medications they're taking their medicines they're getting refills from the pharmacy that's also generating data for the uh, algorithm to see oh it looks like they haven't refilled their medication in 30 days they're 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 out of their medicine they haven't been taking it so they're a non-compliant patient well so, and it's also you know, generating fodder for the uh, sales teams on the pharmaceutical companies because I'm sure they're going to have access to uh, the same okay. technology so they can run a report really quick before they're about to walk into uh, I don't know whatever it's going to be in the future I don't know if we're going to call it a doctor's office or not but as they're going in to peddle their wares, they're going to be like, look, we already know that 67% of the people that come to you for treatment have this, 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 and this wrong with them. And we have this, 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 and this medication to treat all of those things. And you'd be stupid to get it anywhere else. And not only that, they can see what medication is most popular, which one the patients are more willing to take uh, regularly uh, with the side effects tolerated, whatever. And, you know, at a certain point, these algorithms are going to be so advanced, you're not even going to need a medical doctor. You're not even going to need it because an algorithm can assess the patient's chart and mm. see what they're missing. They can see what they need. They, uh, the patient will end up entering the information themselves. So there's, um, there's no errors in the medical record. Um, they're going to, because the doctors are training the computer, oh, well, when I select this diagnosis code, because they, they want you to specify, there's something called, um, it's 
called SNOMED, S-N-O-M-E-D. And it's mm. uh, the nomenclature. It's the verbiage of the diagnosis codes. And so when you select a specific diagnosis code, you have to have a, it, it, it indicates a specific complexity. So when you say when you select diabetes, it's going to be diabetes with elevated blood sugar. That's what you need. So there's no confusion later on down the road when you're trying to order medication for patients. And at a certain point, the decision making is going to be taken over by AI. It just there the way the data is being collected and collated and archived, the, the computers will have access to all of that. The mm -hmm. algorithms will, and so they'll be able to determine with pretty pretty accurate results what the patient actually needs, what's going to work best for them. Mm -hmm. and these algorithms they don't need to sleep. They don't need to take time off for vacation. They can work twenty four seven, and so you're 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 basically having doctors training their replacement. That's what it all amounts. To. Yeah. And well, and coming. here's the other thing it, too. It might be it might be twenty years down the road, but it's coming. These doctors are working themselves out of a job. Right. Well, yeah, but but here's the other thing too that uh, that you and I both noticed because we were talking about it, you know, almost two years ago or whatever is the way that they're now systematically starting to unsilo uh, all of the data wells in the healthcare industry so that all the different databases are going to start talking to one another, where in the past they didn't because, again, that was supposed to all be a part of HIPAA and it's your, your private information and we can't have it unless you give us access and all that bullshit, right? Um, so what happens when they start integrating, uh, your medical history and information with your social credit information? And just like we hear in the, you know, the parody, you go to order a pizza from Domino's and they're like, Oh, well, we see that, you know, your doctor has actually recommended that you shouldn't be eating this type of food. Um, so if you really want to order it, it's actually going to cost you like three times as much. Because yep. exactly. you're not supposed to have it. Yep. And, you know, it's, um, it's that uh, they, it was a really slick change that they made and people barely noticed it. And I didn't notice it either until I started looking at it. You know, they, they used to have something called electronic medical record. Mm -hmm. And now they have something called an electronic health record. And mm -hmm. there's a difference between the two. I don't know if I had talked to you about this or not, but the difference between an EMR and an HR. An electronic health record is cloud-based. An electronic medical record is basically a uh, computer medical record system enclosed. It's a closed circuit. And it's only accessible from certain points of access, like a computer and a doctor's office. It's right. the only way you can do it. The EHR is cloud-based. So you can access it, as access it from, from any computer connected to an internet connection. So like the system that we use now, we switched over in 2015 to eClinical Work, which is a nationally used electronic health record system. And they're based out of Denver. And the, our, our patient's data, our patient's health records are actually in a server in Denver. And I can go from my computer at home to the computer at the office, to the computer at the nursing home, and I can go to the website and I can log in and I can see all of our patients' information. And it's protected by a firewall built into the website itself. So the internet security is there, the quote unquote internet security is there. Um, and it, it, it's monitored 24 seven by the, the good folks over in India uh, with mm. their 
her uh, lovely accents that you can't understand half the time. And um, though they do try to uh, speak clearly, they don't succeed most of the time. And um, yeah, we switched from an EMR to an EHR in 2015. And it really shocked me at how in depth the data is that they that they want you to put in and it's like it's absolutely insane i think if people really knew what was actually going on regarding um, medical records and ai and um, that sort of thing in the healthcare system they would probably be less inclined to be, i don't know i mean people think people know they're being watched now and they still use freaking uh, ring cameras and echo dots and mm. Alexis. They know they're being listened to and they know they're being watched and they'll do it anyway. You know, well, yeah, I there's a certain percentage of those people that, that aren't going to stop that behavior no matter what you do. Yeah. Um, but there are people who, when when it's explained to them the right way and it seems like at the you know, like at the exact right moment, uh, they'll start to get it and it'll it'll click into place in their brains about what is actually unfolding around them. Um, but yeah, there's some people that just won't, like no matter what you do, and you have to know who you're talking to uh, when you're trying to explain these things to them because otherwise you'll get frustrated uh, and it'll make you angry. I can't remember... Where I saw it at, it was a video they were talking about, maybe it might have been an article um, for about one of the, I think it might have been from Fierce Health. Um, they were talking about the future of healthcare, mm -hmm. and they were saying that when you go to the hospital for care, or whatever, they're, what they're wanting to do is they're wanting to put doctors, quote unquote, doctor's offices in hospitals, so that when you go to the hospital, when you're admitted to the hospital for whatever, reason your doctor is there at the hospital to see you but it's not like he come they come in to see you the room that they put you in is like um it's almost it's like a it's like a hotel almost it's like a hotel it's like an air of a hotel it's like or an airbnb you have a a, a, like a a room that's decorated like a bedroom and then you have but it's like this really sleek uh modern design and then you have this big giant screen on the wall and there's a camera in there somewhere and you're you're visiting with the doctor through the through the screen on the wall and your um the, the machines that they use to check your vital signs blood pressure your heart rate oxygen level all that stuff is available in the room and it's wireless and remote so that if there's no wires there's no nothing you just attach the device it reads the data, it puts it up on the screen for the doctor to see. There's no really not a need for a nurse because everything is kind of everything that the nurse would be doing is done by the computer. And the doctor sees you, they say, I don't even know how they do it an exam. I guess they're they're putting they're throwing that out and just going based off of visual, whatever can be seen through the video camera. And then I guess if there's anything hands on that needs to be done, then they send in somebody to do that. But I mean, they're trying to make it like this concierge type of service when you go into the hospital. That's what they're, well, they're, what they're leaning into. Mm -hmm. And um, several years ago, I think when I was in nursing school, they started talking about, so I was a, a CNA for like a year and a half, and then I was a medication aide for another year. And then I went into nursing school. They always called them patients. But when I was in nursing school, they started referring to them as clients. Well, the client said, Blah 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 blah, and I'm like, why are you calling them clients? It's like, well, we're trying to, they're trying to create this rapport with the patient to where they don't feel like they're just they're they're a patient that they're you know they're being dictated to. They're 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 wanting to the them to feel like they're a part of their healthcare that they're they're a part of the team, and so they're changing the the tone of the interaction by calling them clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're changing the words. Yeah, um, and I'm which, like, whenever they start changing words, uh, you need to start paying attention. That's 
absolutely. And I was like, that's just, it never sat well with me. So every time they would refer to him as a client, I would in turn refer to them as a patient. Because <laughs> that's what they are. They're patients. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's been insidious. It's been going on for probably longer than I've been alive. And uh, oh, yeah. it's just, you know, they, they encroach ever more every every year, every day. It's a little bit more, it's a little bit more. And they always, they're turning up the heat, like a frog in the boiling pot, just slowly turning up the heat. Well, and so people are walking right into it. They're, they're, just, they're just eating it up. They're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And, you know, they're throwing all this technology at these hospitals and stuff. And, like, the cost of IT in hospitals and healthcare has exploded. Oh, my God. It's got to be astronomical. It has exploded. And guess what? Patient outcomes aren't any better. Oh, they're I don't not. doubt it. Not one bit. And, uh, oh, it was, in a, it was in an article I was reading on a website. They were talking about, um, I think it was a hospital in Houston. They were talking about how... The um, the the cost of healthcare has gone up, and it was because of the technology that they've been implementing. Well, yeah, and because they're the they're always time. buying new machines. That's the thing is there's always a newer machine to buy, and when you're buying it for an entire hospital, you're not talking about like tens of thousands. You're not talking about hundreds of thousands, you're talking about millions of dollars worth of equipment. Uh-oh. Did we lose Fido? I'm here. Oh, uh -oh. okay. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear can you, you now. Me? All right. My, 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 um, headphones are probably about that. <laughs> I hope not. But yeah, it's um, especially when you when you get to that level where it's an entire hospital, uh, like when when mom went in before she died, and and again we were in the emergency room for a while, uh, and then we went up to a, a standard room for the night. I'm trying to remember, was it? I think it was just one night we were in the hospital. Uh, memory's fuzzy. That might be because of the weeds. <laughs> but um, yeah, there was there was equipment all over the place, and and of course, you know, everything at the registration desk is computerized, and they've they've all got like little machines on dollies that they're they can wheel around when they need to, oh. and it's just it's it's literally just machines all over the place now. Um, like it, when, it creeped me out so much just to be there. Like it was so cold and sterile and unwelcoming. Yeah. When, uh, JP was in the hospital, um, they, the, the hospital had, I think they were iPhone 14. There was like six of them spread out across the nurse's station. Like I happened to walk by one one day and they had like six of them spread out and there was one for each nurse and the nurses would use that to like, if they had a patient with wounds, like JP, they have, they would take a picture of the wound to attach it and they could attach it to his chart from that iPhone. Ooh, fancy schmancy. <laughs> And and the iPhones, I mean, they take really good clear pictures. So I mean, it's not like they didn't have. I mean, they had really good pictures of the wounds. And so, like, um, they could do that. They could. Um, oh, they even could um, connect the intercom in the room, the phone, so they could answer the intercom with the phone. So if they were somewhere down the hall and the inter the, and he pushed the button to call the nurse, they would answer the phone. Instead of having to be at the nurse station answering call up. Yeah, well, you could probably just do that through an app. Yeah, I think that's what they were doing. Yeah, that would that wouldn't be too difficult was, with the technology was, we have. That was new. I had never seen that before. And, uh, well, yeah, but, but did yeah. they did they actually answer it when you call? That's the thing, because half the time when you call, they just don't answer. But yeah, they would, but then they would forget that we called. <laughs> 
Oh, so well, like then there was it just a couple didn't matter times. anyway. Right. So he would he called because he wanted something for pain, and they're like, "Okay, we'll sit. Well, I'll let the nurse know." And I'm like, "Okay." And then like two hours later, nothing. And we're like, uh, are you, and I fell asleep. I it, if I had been awake, it wouldn't have been a two hour wait. But he was like, "I don't want to be a burden to them." I was like, "You are here. They are here to pay. They are paid to do a job." Okay. So um, don't feel like you're bothering them. This is what they get paid to do. <laughs> so I was like, you need to quit waiting so long. Stop being so nice. And he would get on to me because I would go bust at him. And I'm like, he's like, don't, don't go bust at them. They're, they'll, it'll make them treat me even worse. I was like, <laughs> uh, no, no, we're not having this. He would butt heads a couple of times. I would go, I'd be like, I'll go tell the nurse. He's like, he's like, no, don't, don't. I was like, I promise I'll be nice. Be nice. <laughs> But I got mad one time because they waited so long to bring him his pain medicine. I was like, he needs something for the pain. He can he literally writhes in pain, and I can't stand to watch it. It wasn't all bad. Most some of it was good, but I just I was not about to let him endure all of that by himself. So did put, you let them know that you were a nurse? Well. The first time, because we had two hospitalizations, so he right. did. So the first time I did, we did tell them quite frequently. I was telling everybody, yeah, he's a, I'm a nurse, and I, I know a little bit about this and that, because they were, like, over-explaining everything. And I was like, well, I, I know what you mean. I'm a nurse. I got it. They're like, oh, okay. And then that would kind of calm them down a little bit. I feel like he did get pretty decent care the first go-around. Well, the second go-around, I didn't really say that I was a nurse. I just kind of watched them. And I really didn't care for the lack of communication that we had the first the first few days. I mean, it was like, they were like, oh, well, we'll go find out, blah, blah, blah. And then they we'd never hear back from anybody. And then the mm -hmm. plan would change, and then they would never tell us why. Or they wouldn't keep us updated about the surgery, because every time they scheduled him for a surgery, surgical procedure, they wouldn't tell us that the time had changed. They would just... They, we were like, well, are they going to do it today? Well, they're they're running behind. And we had to ask them. It was like pulling teeth to get them to call the surgery team and find out what the heck was going on. And then um, things got a little bit better. But uh, then I finally told them, because my sister, she's like, she said the same thing. She's like, did you tell them that you're a nurse? Because they might give him better care if they know that you're a nurse too. And, you know, they, they like to take care of their own. I was like, yeah, sometimes they do. <laughs> So I was like, you know, I don't think I have told them that I'm a nurse. And then I did. And it's like, it's weird because then suddenly the care got a little bit better. It was the weirdest thing. I mean, they didn't know and he got shitty care. And then I told them and then they got better. Hmm. Huh. Interesting. I'll have to remember that for next time. <laughs> but, uh... Well, hopefully there isn't a next time. Right. I hope not. Like God, that's, I hope not. That, you know, that would be the best possible outcome, I would think. They still, they still have yet to tell us what caused it. Really? They have no, yeah, they have no idea why he got that infection. No clue. Huh. I, I even asked the infectious disease doctor. He goes, "It just sometimes happens." I'm like, "That's not an answer." Right. I don't, I don't like that answer because this could very well happen again, and I do not want this to happen again. Like they seek, wow, yeah, I, I would not, uh, I probably would have gotten thrown out of the hospital. So I'd have been they, like, oh, okay, so you can sequence the coronavirus in 72 hours, but you don't know what causes this? Are you kidding me? Right. right. And so what's crazy is um, the infectious disease doctor actually mentioned, because the second time we were there, we had the same infectious disease doctor, and he was like, well, we, we need to order a CT scan to look at his, uh, his test and see if there might be a perforation. Because if there's a hole in his colon that's leaking into his abdominal cavity, that could definitely cause that. Mm -hmm. And so um, he ordered it. And then it was like two days later, they still hadn't done it. And I'm like, are we going to do this or not? And the surgeon was like, what? Or the nurse practitioner for the surgeon was like, I don't, I don't think it's necessary. And I thought I was like, well, he thinks there might be a perforation causing these abscesses. He's like, oh, I didn't know that. I was like, yeah, maybe you should go talk to him. 
you know, before you come in here and start telling me that we're not going to do so. And um, so they went ahead and did it, and he had to have oral, he had to have uh, oral contrast, which is a, um, a, a solution of iodine that he had to drink. And then they had to um, give him some uh, as an enema as well. And then they let it sit for a minute, and then they do the CT scan, and it lights up the colon right. on the scan. And it shows if there is any leakage, any holes, if, if the dye is going into places it shouldn't. Right. And um, they said everything was clear. There were no holes in his colon. And there was, mm. I mean, they couldn't, from the CT scan, they could not tell there was any reason why the abscess was there. They could still see them. They said that he, that when he discharged from the hospital, he still had abscess to the abdomen. He still, it was still there. And, mm. but they couldn't tell us why. And it's kind of tunneling towards his left hip, and that's why he was hurting his hip so bad. So, and I looked up because the initial hospitalization is that it's something called coronary gangrene, and um, it's basically um, a, a, an infection that just eats away at the tissue, surrounding tissue. And so they, when they did the surgery, they had to go in and they clean out the debris, and then they had to. Uh, like cut away the damage and dead dying tissue is in there. So that's where a lot of his pain was coming from. They cut out a lot of tissue. So um, that type of infection he has is actually pretty rare. And it only affects like 97 to about 100 people every year in the United States. So it's a pretty rare infection. And they said, I was reading up on it and just from like a cursory search, they said that um, it typically affects men. Um, there are some women that get it, but it's mostly men. And about half of the men who get it are alcoholics. And uh -huh. so I thought, I thought that was interesting too. Because it, 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 they kept asking if he was diabetic. Not a single person ever asked him how much alcohol he drank. Are you serious? No one ever asked that question. Wow. I am not, I am not shitting. They never ask. Yeah, not I remember one. going to the free clinic to get treated for, uh, what was the last thing I got treated for? Gonorrhea, I think. And uh, like what, within the first five questions, it was like, how much do you smoke? How much do you drink? They asked him about smoking. They asked him if he smoked. And they never asked him if he drank alcohol. Hmm. I was that, like, that is, I, um, that I'm does like, stand out. That really does. Because you would think, uh, you know, again, understanding that it's 2023 and we've just spent, whether you see it this way or not, we've just spent, the last four years under medical martial law, right? Like a, like a severe, uh, uh, like a pocket of time where people, if they were going to develop things like, oh, I don't know, alcoholism or drug addiction, it was a perfect opportunity. You know, it's uh, the world's been shit for four years. It might as well get high, get drunk. Right. And they don't even ask him. Like, we, nope. we actually know that alcoholism has gone up in the last four years because people are trying to drink their problems away and, and they don't, nope, you don't bet, even care. You, you can bet they tested him for COVID and flu, but alcohol, nah, we don't need to know that. That's not relevant information. Are you crazy? <laughs> wow. I was, and the whole time I was like, I was in my head, I was like, should I tell them that they need to ask that question? Like, no, surely they know. So I was like, let me just see, wait and see. Nope, never, never once. No, it never. wasn't written down and, on the sheet that and, has all the questions that they're supposed to ask. So Here's the other thing, too. When they discharged him the first time. They sent him home with two antibiotics. One is called Flagyl. One is called Septonere. Flagyl, and I know this, and I told him this because I knew it. They never said anything about it. Because they never asked him 
about his alcohol intake, they never told him that he shouldn't drink alcohol while he was taking the slide there. They never said those words to him. I know they didn't. And when we got home, I told him, I said, if you drink alcohol, you're on this flagell. You're going to wish you were dead. And mm. I said, you do not need to drink alcohol. Well, he decided to test it. And um, he said it was the sickest he's ever been compared to what he went through. He says, I'm not ever doing that again. I was like, I think maybe it's time to stop drinking completely. <laughs> he's like, I think you're right. And, uh, but they never told him to avoid alcohol while he's taking flat hmm. And that's like one of the first things you tell people when you give them an order of flat. Do not drink alcohol while you're taking it. It will make you sick as a dog. That's just, there's just so much that, and then people don't know this if they're not told. And they're expecting these, these medical professionals to be able to tell them everything they need to know in preparation for their treatment and they just they're like, nah, it's whatever. Just the the nonchalance that I see is just it's it's remarkable. Hmm. Well imagine what it's gonna be like in twenty thirty. They won't have to. I mean it already I mean I'm just seeing rampant what's the word? not just, it, it's just indifference is mm. it's just sheer indifference they don't care and it's really rare to find someone who actually gives it. and we actually blessed pretty well with uh that one nurse that we he had um his name was harvey i'm not i'm, I'm probably gonna brag on him for probably the rest of our lives mm. he was he was everything a nurse should have been and i was so glad that um he had that nurse because Harvey was, he brought him out of his shell. I was actually really worried about his mental state the second go around with it. And, um, if he was getting really down about everything and he was really depressed about it. And then Harvey shows up, Harvey just drew him right out of that shell and just got him laughing and talking, being more positive about stuff. And I couldn't even do that. And so, and I guess maybe it's because he was a guy and he finally, there was, finally somebody who had but he had some symbols of a connection with. And I'm okay with that. But um yeah, it was it was really nice to see that there was actually somebody who cared in all of the nurses and all of the doctors that we you know. now the surgeons were pretty cool. They were I mean, we just didn't see them very much. I mean I, I got the feeling that they cared. Um but we just you know we saw them pretty sporadic. And then we had one nurse just looked like she was on autopilot. And they were like, because it was funny because we got to the regular room after he got out of ICU the first time. And they and I said, yeah, I've been with him this whole time. She's like, you were in here with him with an ICU? I was like, yeah, I didn't. I haven't left this time since. She goes, well, they weren't supposed to let you stay. I was like, I would like to see them try to remove me. From you. <laughs> it's like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm gonna. I'm sleep. I'll sleep on the floor if I have to. I don't care. But, Damn, they didn't even have him in a room with like a couch. There, there was like a. a it was a chair, an armchair that kind of. Oh, oh broke I down hate those! Too. I hate those. It was absolutely horrible. Absolutely horrible. When when he got to med surge, they actually had like a. It was more of a couch type chair, even wide, and mm. it broke down into almost a bed. So I, I I could actually stretch out and actually lay down. Um, oh, nice. Kind of sit up. I don't sleep on sit up. It's all the all the but, Yeah, the med surge floor had a better pot. I guess you could. But, um, yeah, I got home. The first thing I did was take a shower because I was like, I smell like beta <laughs> Oh, good lord. Iodine. I smell like that, you know, that stuff that they put on your, um, on your wound, on your, like, when you scrape mm -hmm. your knee or something. Yeah. That stuff. I felt like I smelled like that stuff. And I was well, like, yeah, I have Because that's what hospitals check. smell like. It's disgusting. This hospital did, for sure. Ugh. 
I'll be happy to never set foot in another hospital the rest of my life. I really will. Like they, yeah, they creep I, me out as much as public schools do. I don't mind hospitals. I mean, I, I, I've always felt at ease at a hospital. I've never felt uncomfortable and weird about hospitals. And it's, I don't know. I, I don't know what it is. I, I, I don't, it doesn't bother me. Him on the other hand, he does not. Mm. He's, he's like you. And I guess, I, I guess maybe it's because I'm, I'm used to it. Because I worked in them and I, I know the inner workings of them and nothing is really a mystery to me. It's, I, I understand the purpose of all aspects of the hospital and maybe that's, maybe that has something to do with it. Because I know what each, I know what everything is supposed to do. You know, you, someone who's never worked in healthcare before, you go in the hospital and you see all this crap on the wall. You have no idea what any of it does. I imagine it's pretty unsettling. So you can wonder, what is it? What is it for? <laughs> it's like, what implement of torture is this? Yeah, that probably is pretty unsettling. What What are all those wires for, and why do those things yeah. look like clamps? And is that supposed to go yeah. inside of the body? And that goes somewhere? where? And what? that goes where? <laughs> you put that where for how long? I don't, I don't want to have to, I don't want to mess with it. Name one building in town where more people died. What, than a Arkansas? hospital? Uh, Arkansas? That's kind of what creeps me out about a hospital. Really? I used to work in a haunted nursing home before. I mean, besides the super bugs and MRSA and all that stuff, and C. diff and all those. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, those are pretty bad. Pretty bad. The C. diff is avoidable. Uh, MRSA is sometimes not, but the C. diff is definitely avoidable. And here's the thing. I never understood. They know that these high-powered antibiotics can cause um, and uh, C. diff and there. They know that it kills off the good flora in the gut. They know that. And that it increases your risk of yeast infection, it increases your risk of C. diff infection. I don't understand why they don't put patients on probiotics when they give them a antibiotic. Because they can't, they don't address food at all, do they? They'd never address diet, except to say you can't have certain foods. Take the pill form to get what, <laughs> what you need. Here. Oh, that counteracts with this other. So here's a third pill. And now you have nine pills you have to take today. But yeah, it's always been about uh, managing the, uh, the symptoms as opposed to actually treating the cause that way for a while in allopathic medicine some would say ever since the beginning you know i would say that the second time he went in the hospital they were serious about his diet 